everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode 11 of season three of Revise and Resubmit. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. So, Kim, a uh, question of the day is, have you <laughs> taken a class in leadership? Well, surprisingly, the answer is yes, although I don't think I knew it at the time. My <laughs> master's degree is in social science. It was an interdisciplinary degree that had us taking courses in all kinds of areas, so yes, I did take a leadership class, but it's really a whole other story for another episode. Um, but it was structured in a way that leaders were supposed to emerge from these student groups and then lead the group on a specific project. I definitely wasn't the leader who emerged from that. But anyway, more information than you wanted to know. So I feel like we might be on to a topic for a whole nother season of Revised. Yes! <laughs> Okay, so I have not taken a course in leadership, although here in CNIS, we do offer a master's degree in organizational leadership in communication studies. And I know that in the College of Human Environmental Sciences, you can earn a graduate certificate in consumer science department, um, specifically in conflict resolution. And uh, is that leadership? It feels like leadership. I don't know. (laughs) So my question is, if you don't cl- take a class in something, can you learn it? And I mean, I think the answer is yes. Um, but having intentional opportunities to learn and develop skills like leadership, that's really important. Yes, you are 100% correct. And today we're going to talk with Dr. Duran Meng, an associate professor of public relations and the founder and director of the University of Georgia's Choose China program. She's going to share with us some tips about leadership, but also talk about how leadership opportunities lead to greater visibility, with, which is particularly important for women. That's right. And I think today's guest really helps us better understand some of the issues that women and minorities face in the areas of leadership and in public relations. Today's conversation takes us on a deeper dive into this topic, and our fantastic guest helps us better understand it all uh, using the research, even while she was here at UA. That is correct. Today's conversation is going to be a great one. Welcome, Dren. Welcome, Dren. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's wonderful to have you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, I have to start off and just say congratulations on the new book that just came out. We're definitely going to get into this a little bit more in our conversation. Um, but I have to ask, just to kick this off, what's your best leadership tip? What's a big takeaway from this, this book that you, that you published? Um, there are so many great <laughs> takeaways and insights, you know, from this three-year-long project. <laughs> it is so hard to just narrow down in one or two things. But absolutely, if I have to pick several, I would say the best takeaway for not just for me as a researcher or for my co-author, but also for those emergent leaders in the field or students soon to be leaders. Mm-hmm. I would argue that leadership development and the participation opportunities really should go hand in hand by connecting the knowing dimension, the doing dimension, and the being dimension, especially for those underrepresented groups, women of color, and other minorities. Hmm. Okay, that's a great takeaway. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think we'll definitely be getting a little bit more in depth into that because I am interested. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we're going to start off, um, we have uh, kind of a get to know you part of the podcast, and this is the very um, first thing that we do, kind of a rapid fire series of questions. I'm going to let Annalisa start with this. So first question is, where did you grow up? Um, And then a follow up is, tell us where you are now. Sure. I was born and I grew up in China. 
and I finished my college education in China, then did a couple of years uh, practice in the field, then moved to the States to continue my uh, graduate education. And now I am at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, not far from Alabama. Nice. And when were you at the University of Alabama? Um, it was between 2005 to 2009. Okay. Perfect. So when the um, young Ren was thinking about what she wanted to be when she grew up, what was that? What did you want to be? Did you kind of know that you wanted to be a professor and get into academia? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought about that direction, you know. And yeah, when I was in college, when I look up at my professors, it's like I admire them, but never thought I could be one of them. Mm. Yeah, when I was young, you know, I always had a dream that I will grow up to be a journalist, a fearless journalist, to just go into the field and cover all, co- all kinds of controversial stories and, you know, write uh, <laughs> those short comments and uh, <laughs> stories and reveal the truth to the world. That was what Yang Jun was considering to be the future uh, journalist. Well, I love that you said you wanted to cover controversial topics. I think that's fantastic. (laughs) All right. So do you have a favorite memory or a fun story about your time here at the University of Alabama? Wow, so many. I I would say those four years. um, Well, first of all, let me say, I never thought that I would uh, continue a doctoral degree, a doctoral program at the University of Alabama. I went there for my master's degree. Uh, mm-hmm. Then I ended up in doctoral program. So the full <laughs> year, I know, it's like when, when every uh, time I had grad students came to me, asked me about those application tips to doctoral program, I have to tell them, you know, I'm so sorry. I went to a, such a special, unique route that <laughs> I, I couldn't <laughs> offer really, you know, uh, insightful tips for you guys to find the right program to apply. I was so lucky and so fortunate to uh, just get moved up to the doctoral program based on my uh, professor, Dr. Bruce Berger's recommendation. Mm -hmm. So that four years really, uh, you know, sort of like uh, imprinted uh, me as a a true Bama fan Mm. uh, with so many uh, sweet memories. uh, Yeah, with my cohort, Uh, with my professors I still remember that I always uh, get a chance to grab a cup of coffee with Kim Mm -hmm. at the uh, cross part of the Publix I remember it's still there (laughs) (laughs) then we grab a cup of coffee and talk about uh, you know research talk about the collaboration Uh, then yeah uh, visit uh, the University Recreation Center that I uh, instructed, <laughs> you know, the... Yes. Yeah, yes. you remember that? Yeah, all I those do. cardio training workshops there. Yeah, all kinds yeah. of a sweet memory that uh, really make me think Alabama is like sweet home for me. Nice. Okay, so do you, um, do you, are you a Bama fan? Are you a Georgia Bulldog fan? Do you, are you a Bulls fan? And most importantly, what does your daughter Angelina wear on game days? Wow, I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on the podcast. <laughs> because later this will go, you know, online. Um, well, personally, I say both, you know, because yeah. I had my route with Alabama that four years cheering so loud for uh, the Alabama team. And now after being at Georgia almost 10 years, of mm-hmm. course, the, that go dog spirit <laughs> stays with me. <laughs> and uh, for, for Angelina, the overwhelmingly her school, you know, pretty much ask all kids to just wear uh, your team uh, outfit on a Friday uh, yeah. in the fall semester. So she definitely is a dog. <laughs> and she will say she's a little dog. And in her <laughs> swimming team, uh, she was taken care by big dog. 
<laughs> then she told me when she grow up, she want to be that big dog to take Aww. care of little dogs. Aww. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. So I want to get into some of the scholarship that you do. Can you give um, us and our listeners an elevator pitch on your research? Okay. Very challenging elevator <laughs> pitch. <Okay. laughs> so let me say that... Uh, my research specialization really started my uh, doctoral research uh, program with uh, Dr. Bruce Berger that uh, we discussed uh, what does leadership mean to population professionals. And I think uh, since my dissertation research, uh, my uh, expertise and specialization have focused on leadership in populations and the dimensions of leadership to make population practice more effective. Mm-hmm. And then later on, I moved on to the global perspective to look at the leadership in populations, then talent management, uh, leadership development, and recently is more about a woman, a minority, those underrepresented uh, groups, leadership development, and participation opportunities. So it's all centered around the concept or the construct of leadership, but kind of branched out to reach different layers or different aspects when we look at leadership in populations. So that's an excellent elevator pitch, by the way. Um, You wanted to be a journalist and journalism isn't super far away from public relations, but how did you get started doing this line of research. And I I guess what I'm asking is, um, you know, I'm a a journalism professor and you're a PR professor. So what, what got you started? And I know you said that it was your master's program here, but was it taking a class? Was it doing a research project? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I think it is a combination of my professional experience and also, uh, my, uh, the very first class that I took at Alabama. So I told you guys earlier that I worked uh, as a journalist when I graduated from college in China, in Shanghai, China. Uh, Then I started covering uh, like financial news. Well, unfortunately not controversial topic that I dreamed (laughs) of. Uh, So very typical, you know, standard (laughs) financial news related corporate communication. Then I get to interact with the PR people back to that time. Then I thought, whoa, their job is also cool and, mm-hmm. and uh, fun to get to engage with different group of audience. Uh, that kind of triggered my interest to look at the other side of the story. Then after I came to UA, the very first class, and I still remember that seminar, I have to reach out to the professor to request to uh, have permission since I was a master student back that time. Mm-hmm. And that seminar only opens to doctor students. It's a doctor seminar called International PR and taught by Dr. Bruce Berger. And then I got his permission. Very, very lucky, very fortunate. So I sat in that class and the entire semester discussion on population related topic, especially uh, the international perspective, really get me into that uh, interest and that passion that, oh, wow, I just want to do more research to find out more about this field. And then the journey started. What do you consider to be one of your more interesting findings from some of your studies? And it can you can tell us about several of them if you'd like. Okay. I would say... The, the very first one is woman. This is largely based on my most recent project and the book. Uh, since it just published earlier this year, uh, lots of my thoughts uh, still stay with this book, uh, even though we need to move on to work on multiple other projects simultaneously. One of the uh, most important insights that we got from the, the from this project based on our conversation with those senior executives, uh, those female senior executives in the field, uh, is women really need to address and to push for the importance of gaining visibility 
through both leadership development opportunity and the leadership participation opportunities. They need to gain visibility and to build a much stronger and effective mentor-mentee relationship to continue to uh, build their influence as leaders in the field and also cultivate the next generation of young professionals. Ooh. Okay. That's long. I, I know. Sorry. No, no, no. But that, that, was, that was great. So we it, have many follow-up questions. Yeah. <laughs> So one of my questions is, is, is it, so here I am, um, not a college undergrad, that's for sure, not, not a high school student, not a middle school student. Is it too late for me to develop leadership um, skills? When, when do you, when can you develop leadership and where do those opportunities come from? Mm, Never late. (laughs) <laughs> Never too late to Woo! develop any leadership skills. And I would say uh, leadership development should be a continued learning journey for everyone. So even though, you know, uh, people with those uh, uh, prominent leadership positions were already associated with a job title that tells us that person is in a leadership position, still uh, facing the needs and the demand to continue developing leadership skills and increase that leadership capacity. I think the, the pandemic has changed many things and also taught mm-hmm. us so many things to not just being flexible, but also uh, maybe require a new set of leadership skills as we move forward. Since now lots of organizations started having that discussion and a conversation about a flexible work schedule, uh, work from home, and how do we get <clears throat> things? <clears throat> sorry, how do we get things finished and accomplished in a more uh, dynamic or and a more uh, innovative and creative work environment? Mm. <clears throat> so all this present the opportunities to uh, continue developing leadership skills and those competencies. Uh, from management perspective, from communication perspective, even from the digital and the data analytic perspective. Mm. Okay, so a follow-up question is, you had said in, you were looking at the bigger, like the overarching question, what does leadership mean to PR professionals? And then you kind of took it to a more global perspective and then you were kind of narrowing it down even more and looking at women and underrepresented people within the industry. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what you found with, and and you've elaborated some on women, but what you found with underrepresented people um, through some of your studies? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, in uh, this specific project, we do found that women of color and uh, underrepresented groups uh, face very stubborn or I would say persistent barriers Mm. when they are looking for leadership advancement opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I must say, when they share their experience with us, both from uh, our survey and from uh, the in-depth interviews, those barriers were not surprising, but mm-hmm. I would say they are persistent. It's like over the decades, uh, even the profession has advocated for a more diverse uh, and inclusive environment, but still they are facing that glass ceiling. They do not have the opportunity to get the desired uh, work assignments or they do not have the opportunity to uh, have their voice being heard and being uh, respected. And also they couldn't uh, identify or found that healthy and sustainable mentor-mentee relationship. So Mm -hmm. it's like a lack of mentorship and also Mm -hmm. linked to lack of mentorship. It's lack of sponsorship. Mm -hmm. This is like, especially, uh, you know, uh, important for women of color uh, and uh, the black woman in our sample specifically addressed this. They couldn't identify mentors, and they there's lack of that sponsorship 
who can advocate for them when they are not sitting in that room. So this kind of one, uh, several, you know, uh, very interesting findings that were found. Unfortunately, uh, they are they were there many years ago, and they are still here to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, put hurdles on their leadership development and advancement opportunities. Another thing related to uh, this, uh, their their conversation and comment on the uh, challenge is uh, managing the work family conflict. Mm-hmm. They they can't find that right balance. Uh, they're constantly facing the challenge of balancing work family integration, and it's interesting uh, to find that they tend to uh, reflect upon themselves uh, to. Uh, persuade themselves that they need to maintain that positive thinking and still keep that proactive attitude to look for solutions. Uh, But they do not uh, often turn to their supervisors for resources or looking for those instrumental support. Even, uh, let's say, there's a policy, there's a, a flexible working schedule available within the organization they were so worried using any of those policies or resources will jeopardize their uh, leadership journey. So this is also another, you know, uh, uh, surprising and uh, sort of like uh, uh, disheartening finding uh, when we get to talk to uh, those executives. So I I have a question here, and, and that is, I mean, I think that sometimes we hear the word leadership And it's like, well, okay, I'm not going to be a COO or a CEO or in in the other C-suite acronyms. Um, So, okay, so I'm not going to be a leader. Why does leadership matter? Um, Can you talk about a a little bit about what what leadership is and, and particularly when it comes to like that mentor relationship and why everyone might need some leadership skills? Hmm. That's a great question. I think uh, uh, you are absolutely right. Not everyone needs to be that uh, C-suite level uh, (laughs) person. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And uh, there's only limited people will actually be entitled with that uh, position. And in our book, uh, the project that we kind of discussed the differences of the uh, visible leadership uh, responsibility versus those sort of invisible, but will help you to define your influence. So lots of the situation, I would say individuals, especially professionals, young professionals, they are in the second uh, situation that I described. They might not have that visible leadership position or that job titles, but they are actually in a situation is trying to use different strategies to define and to build their influence. Either uh, maybe the uh, purpose is to get more advanced leadership advancement in down the road, or just in other ways, I want to be empowered that I would like to influence uh, others uh, on certain topics that I believe uh, in uh, from an, you know, professional's perspective. So these are kind of two different routes, uh, could be merged together, but also could be uh, separately in a different way, depend on the person's passion, uh, their vision of themselves down the road, and also their interests. Hmm. I, yeah, that's that's fascinating, um, and I think that I think that that gives it it gives us a lot of responsibility to to mm-hmm. think about how we can be leaders, even if we're not like those leaders with a, a leadership title. Um, and that's I mean I think that that's it, it's it's responsibility, but it's like cool responsibility. Um, it is. Mm-hmm. So I want to shift just a touch. Um, So you are a professor. Um, (laughs) What do you teach? And does your scholarship ever make it into your classes? Sure. And a quick uh, answer to your question is yes, absolutely yes. (laughs) I am trying to integrate uh, 
my some of my research topics and also some of the findings that I thought I hope I was right、uh, could benefit、uh, students. Especially, I would say when we walk into a public relations classroom, a PR course,、uh, I'm sure that we will see that the majority of them are women,、uh, young women, passionate、mm-hmm. and very dedicated.、Uh, dedicated. Some some of them may be the A type students that know what I want to do and I have a plan, so、mm-hmm. I'll get through the list by the end of the day to get ready for next day. So.、Uh, That kind of motivated me to integrate those research findings into my teaching、uh, here for my PR majors.、Mm-hmm. And in、uh, most semesters, I I will always teach、uh, PR campaigns、uh, mm-hmm. to let them work with a client, no matter at the local level or the national level,、uh, to collaborate on a project.、Uh, that is absolutely one of those capstone projects students、uh, will. Uh, need to do, and they are looking for to do it before they get into the job market. And here, I also developed the、uh, PR ethics, diversity, and leadership course. So that is another, you know,、uh, one of the courses that I really enjoyed、uh, to share my thoughts, my experience, and my research、uh, with students.、Uh, so they get to read different.、Uh, Uh, theories and the topics related to leadership, and I also、uh, ask them to share lots of self-reflected、uh, leadership learning and、uh, development opportunities.、Mm-hmm. No matter in positive way, in negative way, or in a frustrated way, that really push them to think about themselves by positioning themselves in the industry. Uh, not just as a young woman, but as a young,、uh, soon-to-be emerging leader in the field.、Mm-hmm. I think that's you know, as you were saying all that, it really kind of struck me as how important it is for our students to see us, other women, in the classroom. And while I complain a good bit when students call me, you know, Kim or Mrs. Bissell or Miss Bissell, and you know, calling the men down the hallway Doctor So and So, I mean, I think what we're doing in effect is is demonstrating leadership to a degree, and exposing them. You know, we're just one. We're just one sort of piece of it, but.、Um, It really just sort of reminds me how important it is for them to see us. So, so it's cool to see see you doing that.、Um, shifting gears on you slightly, when you were at the University of Alabama, you had the opportunity to also overlap with Dr. Jennings Bryant, and I was wondering if you had a, a Jennings story that you might want to share with us. Mm. Yes, Dr. Bryant、uh, was the associate dean back to that time. So,、mm-hmm. uh, the very uh, first uh, piece of memory that I had about Dr. Bryant、uh, was that day when my mentor, Dr. Bruce Berger, said, "Let's walk up to Dr. Bryant's office and、uh, tell him、uh, I recommend you to move into a doctoral program," and he supports that idea. So that was the first time that I actually get to walk into Dr. Bryant's office, and <laughs> you know,、uh, because for master students we don't actually have that direct interaction with him. Yeah. So yeah. I was nervous.、Uh, then I remember he smiled and welcomed me and say, "Welcome you to the doctor pro- doctor program, <laughs> and you are in good hands because Dr. Bruce Berger will be your mentor." Yeah, so that was the first、uh, interaction that I had with、uh, Dr. Jennings Bryant,、uh, because my specialization was in population. So unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to、uh, take、uh, one of the、uh, doctor seminar offered by、uh, Dr. Bryant、uh, during the first two years、uh, in the doctor program. But I always remember we had. You know, doctor student gathering. He was always there and share lots of the stories、uh, with us about、uh, his daughter, 
uh, his daughter's life in New York, mm-hmm. etc. So I mm-hmm. kind of feel I know him, even though I don't directly work with him on any research project. So yeah, uh, Dr. Bryant, such such a brilliant scholar. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. So we're going to wrap it up um, with, I hope, a, a fun question. Um, we have all been zooming a lot. <laughs> <laughs> too much. Yes, <laughs> too much. <laughs> But ho- hopefully we're all crossing our fingers that we'll be um, at academic conferences um, somewhere in, in the near future. Um, can you tell us and our listeners what academic conference are you looking forward to attending in the near future when we return to in-person conferences? Sure. Wow. So many. I miss the travel <laughs> so much. I traveled a lot, you know, for conference and for research and for various reasons. So there are two conferences that I absolutely looking forward to attend if we can return, you know, to that in-person norm- normalcy, mm-hmm. <laughs> hopefully. The very first one is the European Publication Education Association's Annual Congress, which actually is next week in Spain, one of oh. my favorite you know, places uh, to travel to. So uh, unfortunately, uh, with this uh, pandemic uh, never stopping or <laughs> not stopping yet, uh, I, I choose to do it virtually this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next one I absolutely looking forward to it will be the uh, 2022, the International Communication Association Annual Conference, which will be in Paris. Yes. Absolutely is another, <laughs> you know, attractive and amazing destination to go to meet meet with our friends and colleagues in the academic field and from all over the world yeah. yep. so every single person we've spoken to has basically said ICA in Paris <laughs> <laughs> I know that will make the submission really competitive I know I know well, uh, Joanne, it's been such such a pleasure catching up with you today. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with us. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today in our conversation with Dr. Dren Meng. I think it was a really important conversation and I think a reflective one, thinking about the roles of women in leadership positions in the public relations field. And especially if you think about it in the context of minority women in leadership roles in public relations. So I'm going to say it again next week, even more fun coming at you. Uh, Next week, we talk with Dr. Mike Devlin. That last name may sound familiar. That's because we spoke to his fantastic wife, in episode one of season three. You got to tune in. This is a fun, fun conversation. See you next week.